Hi oh, YouTubers, um, here we are in Poirino again in Italy, Santina. This crop circle appeared just the other day, 17th of June. Uh, you can see obviously, you know, it looks like a pretty interesting crop circle. For me it doesn't feel right, um, for a few reasons I'm going to explain further on. Uh, yes, ovals are hard to put down in the wheat, I'm sure. But for me it seems like there's a mixture between the Millennium Dome uh, in the UK and the also the Olympic Stadium. And uh, there's been a few crop circles, uh, very few crop circles in the United Kingdom this year and I, I think they have dubious origins but that's just my opinion. Uh, and most of them seem to be um, talking to each other rather than talking to the bigger guest start or the bigger e uh, archetype. Here we see a very familiar symbol on the top left which is the symbol for the UK Big Brother TV show on the bottom left is the Australian version with the polar clock as the iris and on the right you have Manton Drove Crop Circle which appeared recently so you can see the similarities and the only reason I'm actually including this um, uh, is because this particular one was placed next to uh, an 11 in the in the um, field there was a, a garden bed that had the number 11 and you know esoteric numbers can be used and misused so we get into that duality of, of um, energy which I'll go into later and I'll explain a bit more as we go along into this video another very shabby crop formation turned up in um, Fars, Iran um, and we can see that I thought, you know, something was going on here, so I thought, why Iran? I mean, you know, Iran has nothing to do with crop circles traditionally, and this is the first one. But uh, here you can see I've placed a composite um, of um, a link that I found back to an earlier crop circle, Wallaston Grange, which had 24 alignments, and now this one in Iran makes the 25th alignment. So I really urge you to go back and see my previous videos on the Wallaston Grange in regards to uh, the alignments but you can also see the mound which I've actually highlighted a bit more and it symbolically looks like a, a solar symbol so here we have the repetition of this solar symbol but it also doubled up with an alignment it, with the United Grand Lodge of Freemasonry in the UK so a little bit too close to the UK all of this stuff for my comfort now I'm going to um, move towards opening both eyes rather than just one eye and we're going to head over to Shandon Zebo, China for this next series, uh, next part of the video. For those of you who haven't uh, seen my work, or this is the first time that you've come across this kind of crop formation, the first thing you're going to say is, "Ah, oh, garbage! It's just, it's just wind damage, or it's um, it's crop damage." So, for those people, I'm going to go right back through a whole series of events. That, uh, that took about two years to get to this point uh, and um, I'm adamant that this is some form of communication which is on a mythological level so to go from the ground up is going to take some explanation and once you've seen the evidence I'm hoping that you'll realize that this is quite an interesting phenomena worth taking more notice of I will add at this point that uh, I recently had uh, a one and a half hour conversation with um, another crop circle researcher, Nancy Talbot, who has access to uh, some good scientists around her to validate what I'm seeing as um, uh, genuine crop formation splashdown effects, which have anomalous magnetic readings around them and soil samples etc because I can't get to those because I live in Australia and a lot of these events are happening all around the world so this kind of heartened me into um, feeling better about these formations as genuine formations and I had a long conversation with her regarding I was more interested in the narrative and that once you start to see the flow of the story interconnecting the crop formations um, you'll, you, you can come to your own conclusions. I am an artist by trade and you know just because something looks abstract doesn't mean to say it's not communicating ideas it's just the way we interpret them and we have to put them into a contextual framework. 
these little images that you can see the photos that I'm just showing you now were just were random splashdowns that came uh, in 2011 and you can see they're not near any tram tracks so really it would be really difficult for people to actually fake these uh, you know a lot of people are saying that people are walking down tram tracks and, and creating the geometric design or some of them and I can't really disprove or prove that but with these little splashdown effects you can see they're right in the middle of um, right in the middle of the uh, the paddock uh, with no access and the actual point the central point of impact is so far away from a tram track so that would make it much more difficult to fabricate here we see um, uh, another crop circle that appeared in the 9th of August 2011 at Horton near Devises or Devises depends on how you um, say it I'm not from the uh, I'm not from England or the UK so they might say it differently but if we have a close look here uh, apart from the actual glyph itself over to the right which I've arrowed in red you can see these splashdown effects actually forming some sort of a track now this is really bizarre because you know it's crossing over th you know two tram tracks and it's going for quite some distance but it gives you an example of how they've you know someone's actually put these these little splashdowns in the form of a trail or droplets of water which I choose to go in that direction and I'll explain why droplets uh, in the bigger frame of, of talking about water and the metaphor of water so that was 2011 uh, now we I'll take you back further to 2008 in Chicoana Salta Argentina where they had a whole, the whole section of the field here you can see running up next to the hedge line there all this patterning which looks very abstract and uh, again you know this is obviously not the first time this has appeared so it's been sort of quietly appearing in fragment in a fragmentary way next to near or in between other crop formations that had more sacred geometry involved in them Here we had more um, dragon's feet splashdown effects at Silbury Hill 2010, which were unexplained. So now I'm going to go back to 2012, and here we are at Shandon Zebo, China again. Now, 2012 has actually come up with a whole rash of these splashdown events, but in a much larger format. And here you can see Salo, Italy, had a, had. Um, had a powerful effect on the field, all flattened, all random. Also we had one in Rippi, Italy, which are two completely different areas. Here's a nice aerial shot of Rippi. And you can see it's all defined areas within the boundaries of the targeted specific paddock. Uh, we had another one in uh, Cassano di Arda, Italy, which was underreported another one in Scorgiano, Italy, which was underreported. So I've only got a single shot of, of both. So here we can see that we've had about four or five major events in Italy, China, uh, earlier ones in the UK. Now we go back to Tula, Atlantis, Mexico, which was massive. This, was, this one was about uh, acreage, five or six acres and I explained in my last video the connection to uh, the myth of Atlantis going uh, under the water or under the ocean which is an analogy for flooding in a sense so uh, I'll go into uh, deeper in depth into the nature of flooding from an internal point of view rather than an external flooding which uh, I'm not interested in external flooding now Tula Atlantis Mexico uh, formation had created quite a stir and you know farmers don't get excited about a little bit of wind damage I mean these people work with the land every day so obviously something f uh, fundamentally had um, uh, some fundamentally different had appeared here and again when we go back to uh, uh, the connection I mean straight away the Mexicans had made the connection between Tula Atlantis crop formation and the, the massive crop formation that appeared in Krasnodar, Russia uh, in 2011. So here you see the, the massive size of the Krasnodar formation. You know, people 
just don't park thousands of people don't park their car on the side of a major highway to have a look at a natural naturally damaged field they would recognize it you know if it was so obviously something major happened uh, it's not wind damage because I checked out the uh, wind charts in Krasnodar airport for those three days or up to a week prior and post this particular formation and the wind speeds never got over an, uh, an average of six to nine kilometers per hour so here you can see uh, a comparison between the two uh, between Atlantis and Krasnodar now when we see you know when we have a close look at these formations you can actually see really small holes as you can see arrowed in red here small holes wind just doesn't make tiny small holes vertically in crop and then leave exterior crop standing and it's gently laid down so you know the wheat itself or the crop itself is gently laid down so it looks like it's been cut out with a bandsaw beautiful work beautiful patterning but again, you know, I, I still think it looks like flooding and, uh, you know, the theme has been flooding all along for me. Another crop circle back in Italy to confirm this was the Enki E crop circle, which I'm going to show you now. You can also notice the strategic placement of this Poirino Italy crop circle uh, representing the, repre uh, the Sumerian deity of Enki E as Lord of the Waters. Uh, it's right on the edge of it seems to be like right on the edge of a waterfall or a wave and then you can see the damage uh, just touching one of the arms there um, juxtaposed to the road uh, but and you see the opposite side of the road this is genuine damage to crop so anyone who can recognize genuine damage as opposed to um, non genuine damage which we've been noticing earlier in the earlier photos so it was it was warning us that you know some connection to water was coming or some connection to um, flooding or a connection to water. Uh, this is obvious because Enki E was a water deity, a Sumerian water deity. Here's the deity here. Of note here, if you look carefully at the Poirino crop circle, you'll see that it's right next to a four-lane freeway, which many of these crop circles did appear next to the four-lane freeways. Uh, and again, you know, you've got four lanes, which is 1111, which I've highlighted here. Tour de Sorti in Italy was also part of the rash of crop circles that appeared around that time indicating chaos was coming around 11-11. That was in September 2011 but it also has a quite a strong significance to um, a gateway which I'll talk about later on in this video um, in relation to Stonehenge. Another crop circle that turned up in Poirino, Italy was this one here and this was a couple of years earlier. Uh, which came up with the equation of E equals mc squared, uh, a reference to Albert Einstein's theory of special relativity. So here we've got a reference to light, uh, you know, coming up, uh, and the 11, which the 1111 is a frequency or a frequency of light, uh, or a gateway of light. So we'd been warned via many earlier crop circles that there was either chaos and light, like a, a, a a process of duality you know one world would fall into chaos the other would be one of light so which is like a polarization in a sense so here we've got the an earlier this this one was a couple of years earlier in 2010 this one you're looking at now if we make a simple comparison between the two crop circles that appeared in Poirino this one here on the left 2010 which had the code of E equals MC squared uh, which was the special relativity of light You'll note that I've highlighted um, the, what I call the carbon ring. It has uh, number six on the element chart, which is uh, for carbon. And the and the overall image of both of these crop formations look like they're on an atomic level. So they're talking about um, the transmutation of carbon uh, into light. I feel, uh, and in the second one on the right here, you can see that it's got a um, uh, an ancient symbol for the sun right in the middle of it. So there's the link between the carbon e equals mc squared transmuting into light. But again, these were two years apart, these two particular crop circles, so they've actually crossed over a two-year time span. Now the third clue in the Poirino, uh, Italy 
image here is that you know it was connected to Enki E and water. Now water as an element is a composite and this composite consists of two parts hydrogen one part oxygen so it's not really an element. So the hydrogen aspect is really interesting and I'm going to go back to another crop formation. I mean this is like a big hologram you know you've, you've got overlapping stories happening all over the place with this over a two year period the interlocking with each other sometimes there's a gap of a couple of months and then all of a sudden you have some sort of a jigsaw puzzle coming together so it's very complex what we're dealing with here. So I'll take you back to uh, the Wilton windmill crop circle which appeared in May 2010 in the United Kingdom and it appeared right next to a windmill so there was this just sent the crop circle community crazy because it ended up having two codes that came out of it. The first code you see here which somebody equated to the Euler's identity and I felt that it wasn't exactly Euler's identity at all. I felt it was an anagram of Euler's identity which I ended up via a process of uh, negating the repetitive symbols uh, I ended up coming with another equation which you see here but it still didn't make sense until I realized that the um, there was an anagram with the HPI which if we change that to PHI that makes phi so that was completely different and I'd solved the um, the clue there with help from spirit because I got it in a vision so I realized that the uh, the encoded message was talking about energy and the phi was Fibonacci was like a Fibonacci spiral for phi the golden mean uh, one down to zero or equals zero which means it's somehow everything's going back to zero which still didn't make sense until um, I got like a, a eureka event as I said I got a vision with this and there's quite a few other parts that come together to see that what was going on was on an atomic level of our DNA now further evidence was it was near the windmill and of course you can see the blades here actually spinning anti-clockwise which kind of um, mirrored this equation you know this anti anti-clockwise Fibonacci going back to zero so there was a double confirmation there now to get further clues of what was really going on I had to uh, see the outer ring of this particular crop circle and you could see this cross hatching that I've marked in red and uh, then I quickly went to Google and I checked out uh, DNA and sure enough here we got um, the cross matting of nanostructures or nanofibers in our DNA and right next to it was um, a four bladed configuration which anybody can go to Wikipedia and check this out on DNA and see all of this stuff it's all there so I thought bingo there's the windmill but what else came up which was really exciting was um, quadruplex telomere structure which I'm going to show you here now straight away without digressing too far into our macrobiology I realized that this was showing this it was placed next to the windmill and I was meant to find this quadruplex telomere structure which is very deep down in our DNA and of course when you look at it it looks like a four bladed windmill uh, in the center there you've got three green iron balls um, which is again <clears throat> very interesting in terms of the law of um, the laws of vibration or the laws of syncopation when it in terms of vibration and it all sort of fell into place. W what was going on here is I'd realized that the um, quadruplex structure straight away looked like the swastika which is an ancient symbol for the sun and it, so it all started to click into place that with the windmill, um, the sun, the crop circle, the nano, uh, nano matting all of this stuff was pointing towards solar winds and uh, I got a vision like a whole encompassing vision because uh, I got really blocked on this and then it all just unraveled one night in a vision and I started to realize that uh, there was deeper stuff going on in connection with the Sun and I'll break that down for you now here I've placed up an image of the Sun with uh, with a big solar flare um, hitting Earth and how they affect Earth I mean you can see the jellyfish the classic jellyfish model of um, electromagnetic waves as they smack into the earth and then um, then they leave a trail that goes out into space so I needed a, a further confirmation of, of whether or not this was actually talking about you know solar winds 
And of course I've studied alchemy and metaphysics and one of the aspects of the windmill is that it was actually um, four-bladed. Uh, and anybody who knows the symbol for Earth is uh, a circle in the four quadrants, which I'll come back to in a minute because um, what else, as you can see here, I got a, a, an enormous flash of insight that it was hydrogen particles that were spewing out with solar, solar particles, with solar wind. And I thought, hydrogen, you know. Um, so I went looking for hydrogen particles, and I mean, I'm really getting into some deep stuff here, and I might be losing you. But when I found the hydrogen chart, you can notice here the hydrogen 3 spin looked exactly like the four-bladed windmill as well. Now, here's another chart. Uh, most people don't know what hydrogen spin is, but when it's to do with particle acceleration physics. When they start shooting beams of light down particle accelerators, hydrogen has a particular shape. And what happens is, as it can spin around and it can actually um, smack into another hydrogen atom or, or smack into whatever beam that they're pointing the two beams at, and they can actually rotate and spin, and they call that Pauli spin after a guy called Dr. Pauli who was a physicist and depending on which angle that they come in at they can create these different colored shapes as you can see here now why that's important um, that the three spin came up is mainly that it replicated the construction of the windmill the four bladed windmill so we were dealing with some sort of a holographic consciousness that placed that particular crop circle in front of that particular windmill design relating to solar flares, hydrogen and all these other interrelated DNA stuff. Now to back this up I went looking at um, particle acceleration physics charts um, you know pictures of particle acceleration beam beam smashing beams together and all this sort of stuff and this is what I came up with which was kind of interesting and as you can see here this is a beautiful diagram of a gold to gold ion beam collision uh, smashing together in a particle accelerator and you can see straight away that it had 12 segments which was uh, if we see the comparison here's a Wilton windmill crop circle and it had 12 segments so and I thought okay we've got another clue gold you know which is a an alchemical symbol of turning lead into gold and of course gold was represented by the Sun in the ancient days as you can see you know the the central dot and the outer larger ring were, were emphasized in the crop circle so there was a further confirmation that we were dealing with some sort of a massive change coming here where the hydrogen became evident is um, is really on the cutting cutting edge or the cutting interface of how our DNA uh, delinks or unravels and reformats uh, in in connection with suns the sun's solar flares and this has not really been canvassed before and it's not really known within the scientific community as far as I know as I said I got this in a vision but the hydrogen which spews out um, due to the perturbation of the central core of the Sun which is also iron like the central core of the earth is made up of molten iron but remember we go back to that telomere structure that I showed you the quadruplex telomere structure it also had iron balls in the center of it and what happens when the Sun starts to vibrate or um, send out these particular solar cycles every 11.2 years then it of course it spews out these massive solar flares uh, and this huge amounts of hydrogen come spewing out and where I got it I got this part in a vision as well is that um, the iron in the Sun perturbates and causes a subtle perturbation right throughout our solar system causing the quadruplex telomeres to start to spin like a windmill and of course this in turn uh, causes the hydrogen bond on the CGT receptors to delink from their original placement and then they end up reformatting according to uh, a different magnetic frequency or a higher vibration in our consciousness and so this is how our consciousness actually grows. Now to throw a further spanner in the works remember you know this original code um, uh, this very similar to Euler's identity code was found uh, in the original crops of the Wilton Windmill crop circle 
there was also another code found in the negative space, not the positive space. The positive space was the one marked out by the lines, the small lines, the fragmented lines, but there was also a negative space code that came out two weeks later, uh, which I'm going to show you here now. And This starts to make sense because energy can't go down to a zero point uh, unless it transmutes into another form and it must go somewhere else. Energy can't be destroyed and that's what this whole process of alchemy is about. It's about transmuting from one form to another. So the second code here that you can see, comma, but, exclamation mark, XY459. The, the but part was like a warning. It was like saying, but that's not all. So the main clue here is the, you'll notice is the XY which um, any mathematician knows that once we get xy we've got uh, x coordinate y coordinate which is um, a horizontal vertical axis and I thought yep bingo that's a Eureka event we've got um, uh, here's where your cross comes in and we need to go back to the glyph of the the alchemical glyph of the earth as a circle with the four quadrants which then leads on to another diagram of an XY coordinate on a two-dimensional flat plane which you can see here. And here I've got the diagram of the X horizontal Y vertical axis and you'll see right in the center it's got zero and this is uh, also where we bring back that original code that came out of the um, the uh, Euler's Identity Phi code, the, well, the one that I found. So this starts to make sense, but I'm going to take it a step further because this doesn't describe three dimensions because it's missing one of the th uh, one of the planes of, of breadth. It's got height, width, but not depth. So I'm going to place this into a cube. And here I've um, I've got the x y axis with the z added as the uh, height, breadth, and depth uh, into a three dimensional Euclid Euclidean cube of three dimensions. So we can see that this is what the XY was trying to point us towards uh, this zero point I've arrowed here in red, the zero point uh, in th uh, where it's heading is right in dead smack right in the center of that cube but there's further problems when we start to deal with these kinds of geometric shapes especially in metaphysics and the cube or especially the black cube was uh, indicative of the planet Saturn in astrotheology. So Saturn represents time. So all of this uh, energy going in a negative Fibonacci down to the zero point of singularity may have been actually uh, indicating um, that we were heading towards a zero point in time which kind of starts to make sense now that we're heading towards 2012 and the end of time. Also, <coughs> the colour of Saturn was designated as black, and this is where uh, the death comes in. And you know, you see most people that wear black when they go to funerals. Uh, you know, the black square has a, a huge, huge amount of um, study involved into it, and, and I won't digress into that area at the moment. But one just needs to know for the, for the moment that death, uh, uh, death, and time are both associated with Saturn. As I said earlier. Um, with with energy uh, it transmutes um, it, it can only it can be purified yes under extreme pressure and it can actually change I mean this, this is from solids into liquids into gases I mean this is known physics but when you're dealing with metaphysics um, we're, we're still dealing with the same principles of physics so what I've drawn here is um, like a wormhole with a diagram of the Saturnian cube within the tunnel or the wormhole of 2012 which I feel is where we're heading um, you know and I've, I've got a picture of the crop circle at the open gate which is warning us that we're actually about to go through some sort of a wormhole or a time gate um, so this is starting to get you know pretty interesting I'll zoom in a bit closer here and you can actually see that I've I've got the the cones the uh, entry and exit points that go right down to the zero point um, which they, they go down to that, that XYZ axis points. And here's another diagram I've whipped up showing the, the 
adjusted Euler's identity code or the corrected Euler's identity code uh, that was found in the first part and it's actually the, the negative spiral down to zero or so going down to these this cube or this Saturnian cube again this diagram I'm showing you here is of a wormhole and uh, in the throat of it which is where we're heading is you can see there's negative energy involved there that's what everyone's feeling at the moment all this negative energy so that still leaves uh, the 459 in the second half of the equation of the second equation um, but I instantly saw it as a Fibonacci sequence as 4, 5 and 4 plus 5 is 9 and so on so the next progressive number would be um, 14 uh, if we added a further number onto that so I saw it as a Fibonacci sequence so this was the other end of the exit cone that I'm I was talking about in a normal Fibonacci sequence it would start with 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5 and so on so for some reason the sequence was changed uh, it started at 4 which means an altered sequence or it was kind of like coming from another space so the 3 to me indicated you know on so many things so al alchemy you know of separation purification by fire and then cohabitation which is the bringing together of the the constituent parts that have been purified but also the three dimensions of Euclidean time space one has to take a leap of intuition here um, if the first Fibonacci sequence is derived from the three dimensions in our time space or the three dimensional time space then the the other hidden Fibonacci of 459 uh, meant that, it, that it's hidden, that it's actually within the implicate order of the universe not the explicate order of the universe as David Bohm used to term it the final diagram I'm showing you here and I've got the red arrow pointing towards the Saturnian cube um, shows that this is all connected to what they call um, Merkaba uh, ascension mechanics which is all connected with sacred geometry, three dimensional sacred geometry um, which is a very very complex subject and I could not fit in uh, the whole this whole picture in, in w without another two hours of dialoguing about it so I'll leave you with this image and uh, I'll go back to uh, completing um, or you'll see another image a little bit further on of, of the cube going through the um, one of the tetrahedrons you know which is the vertical tetrahedron pointing up towards the heavens and then uh, you'll see transmuting into a sphere but this, this is such a complex subject that needs many many hours to break down I'm briefly scooting back to the, uh, the crop formation I showed earlier in the video of Horton near Devizes 9th of August 2010 and again you can see the cube the fire tetrahedron and the sphere of uh, this is the third dimension starting to break up um, and you know as the purification begins or the journey through the purification towards the unification principle so the whole world's going through this at the moment so it's uh, a natural process of ascension mechanics uh, again a threefold principle of alchemy uh, indicated by um, separation, purification and cohabitation so by now I have to go back to all the flooding themes and we've, we've been on a long digression into um, the planet Saturn and other related subjects of DNA, breaking down DNA and ascension mechanics so I'm going to show you a tree of life here now and show you where Saturn resides on the tree of life in Kabbalah mainly as uh, ascension mechanics are closely connected to the tree of life which was the tree to ascend towards gaining immortality um, many of you may know a lot about Kabbalah some may know nothing so it really behoves people to get out there and do some study and find out about the ancient tree of life as it um, is a very complex system it has alchemical aspects of which um, you can see the round circles there are sephiro connected there's ten sephiro connected um, from you know connecting heaven and earth heaven at top and earth on the bottom and the whole point of Kabbalah is to actually purify each one of those sephiro until one actually attains enlightenment now many people believe that Kabbalah is a, a Hebrew system it is not a Hebrew system at all it is actually an ancient Egyptian system because Ka means spirit, Ba means soul and La means to ascend 
so car and bar are both Egyptian linguistics so the Hebrews actually took that on um, later on uh, and then incorporated into their own spiritual system so people who try to hermetically seal things into a Hebrew system that is just absolutely not true so right up high in the Yud realm which is the archetypal realm which is the interface between the spirit world and the and the physical world uh, we have three planets we have Saturn Neptune and Pluto uh, so here we've got Saturn uh, which I'm going to point to now which was which is indicated astro theologically as the black cube and here we have uh, the position of Saturn right up there in the archetypal realm or the Yud realm so then we'll move down to Malkuth and down here we've got Malkuth where the kingdom of the earth where we reside or a consciousness resides uh, you go back to that glyph here of the earth and then so you can see how far away Saturn is so here's the overall what they call the four worlds of Kabbalah Yud, Hev, Vor, Hev. some have tried to associate this with the creator's name this is untrue um, these are the four states of consciousness in the human mind and the Yud realm, as I said before, is the interface between the spirit world and the human world, which works with symbols and colours, not syllables. And the hair or hair below it are, are what encased or what buried or influenced by the box, the box of time, which is influenced by Saturn, the Saturnian cube. So we'll move on from that and I'll describe it in terms of um, the dualistic concepts of heaven and hell. Remaining, uh, as we say, uh, remaining on this subject. Um, you see the three worlds of uh, the Yud realm, which is the, as I said before, is the intuitive archetypal realm. The hair realm, the second one just below that, is uh, the mental plane. And um, this is pretty much where the box, or the three dimensional box, controls the three lower worlds, which most of us are in. So when you say the hair, which represents a spirit, H E H, represents the spirit or the breath of the Creator, which has two envelopes. Uh, the yurt is masculine, the vor is feminine. Well, those two envelopes of um, of hair, if you connect it to L, is hair L. So anything below the yurt realm is in hell. So many, this has been a lot of misconceptions about this, and a lot of esotericists get it wrong. So they have not done their homework, they've just copied them from other books out on the marketplace, and when you have thousands of years of misinformation, this is what we end up with, you know, Chinese whispers further down the line. So the hair aspect, the spirit aspect, um, um, is a spirit or a realm of spirit in hell. So anything, as I said, anything below that that uh, that, that yurt realm is in uh, a hair l realm. By contrast to hair l, we have hair ven which is connected to Venus which I'll, um, is up in the uh, the red realm there, the archetypal realm so I'll cover this later further on in the video in regards to um, Venus and its role in all of this further the diagram here of the tree of life I've got the Yud realm which is the archetypal realm uh, the lower three worlds are actually underwater uh, as you can see designated by blue and the further down you go the denser in the waters you become and this is why you hear stories of Jesus walking on water or, you know, Noah's Ark floating on water. It was all to do with Kabbalistic studies. So I'm going to take this further into baptism rites, which is what this is all about and what's happening on the planet globally with all these strange crop formations showing us flood formations. Uh, and I'll show the connection between the flooding and the water and the connection to the element of water which is emotion and violence or in this case it's manifesting as violence um, due to very complex um, understanding, understandings of duality because the further we descend down into the tree um, we end up in dualized concepts and fragmented realities and this is why people can't get themselves out of hair L so we need to, uh, I'll break this down for you further. So I'll briefly recap here the uh, the 12 crop formations that showed the water uh, theme. 
in some cases they were droplets of water, in some cases they just looked like out and out right waterfalls, some looked like flooding. So there's two levels to this. Uh, flooding can also be connected to uh, baptism, uh, ancient baptism rites on a singular level. But um, I didn't talk about this earlier, but there's an aspect to Kabbalah when you're dis uh, deciphering the Tree of Life. There's uh, another um, part of uh, Kabbalah that they call Parts of Him, which is talking about the collective aspect of, um, you know, like what would be similar to Gestalt theory or archetypal theory. So, and I believe that it's on that level. I believe it's talking about the whole planet. And I believe that a lot of these countries that are showing here are just about to go into a major major economic meltdown, sociological meltdown, violence and I'll have to go back to the Indonesian crop circle to show you the evidence of this. But briefly before we go to the Indonesian crop circles uh, you'll notice that I've highlighted the Krasnodar Russia 24th of May 2011 in red uh, and also uh, the Shandong Zebo China appeared in 24th of May 2012 so exactly one year later and there's um, a further link going back to the cause out well, or further link going back to another uh, Wallaston Grange crop circle which I covered in my last video but I'll briefly cover in this one as well so now on to the Indonesian crop circles now we're going to scroll back to Indonesia to get to the um, the crux of this Axis Mundi flooding theme and we go back to the Muladra crop circle which is Muladra is the base chakra in the light body uh, out in the chakras, you've got seven chakras, and this is the base chakra. And it was called this because of the four major petals uh, emanating out, so that's why it was very similar to the Muladra base chakra. Uh, this one turned up in Yogyakarta in January, early January 2011, along with another one in Bantul, Indonesia, and both of them were very similar. So they got dubbed the Muladra crop circles. What I found significant about these is they they started to leave England or the UK and they started to span out into other countries um, which was kind of exciting because um, you know these whoever these artists were the, the legend uh, of Mount Tidal goes something like this and this is a pretty crappy translation because uh, it's been changed over from Indonesian to English via Google Translator uh, in the legend that circulated on the island of Java it was told had been there had been several envoys from the Arab countries to spread Islam in the land of Java in particular and Indonesia in general had failed at the macro level because the people of Java at that time were still hanging on to old beliefs uh, they were hanging on to the ancient magical probably paganism of some sort um, the deities that ruled the earth and the sea in the vicinity of Java so they were still hanging on to old pagan deities um, the scholars were sent to spread Islam, the religion of Islam and they got a very serious obstacle um, and it couldn't develop uh, Macro can be said to fail, spread the religion of Islam with a black stone ok the black stone is a reference to the Kaaba stone and I'll get into that again much later um, was to be set in the nation in the land of Java it was placed in the middle of Mount Tidar. So the black stone was placed in the land of Mount Tidar. Um, Sheikh Subakir uh, was apparently involved in this. So that's pretty much the myth there. So now we had the Muladra crop circle and the Bantul crop circle pointing towards Mount Tidar. Another one turned up. Um, well, I just discovered the the Islamic connection to Mount Tidar as the nail of Java, as the Axis Mundi, or the center central pillar of their world, their spiritual world. Uh, we ended up with this Magalang Magalong crop circle, and it was the called the Sun Eleven Eleven crop circle, which is so uh, interesting because this Eleven Eleven has been coming up synchronistically a lot in people's minds and um, there's also a connection that I will show later in the United Kingdom with this um, and as you can see here the diagram it's got the Sun which is rotating anti-clockwise which is um, another aspect uh, that I can connect to the flood myth 
Uh, and you can see the four dots, two dots on either side, and you can see people were, were turned up in 2011, so here you've got um, the 1111 symbols, and you can see the alignments going from Mount Tida all the way up to the Magalang in the Tegal, Rejo, Te Tegal Rejo region, Indonesia. So I aligned up Mount Tida to the Sun 1111 crop circle, because I thought they were using alignments and sure enough it was pointing to a, a great big lake up further uh, northeast into Rawa Penning and this was quite synchronistic because it also had a legend of flooding which was fascinating because this is where we start to get Axis Mundi Islam and flooding coming together. Now the legend connected to Lake Rawa Penning which had been around for about 2000 years um, the marshes were formed by a hole. Um, a strong magician had transformed into a little boy called Baro Clithing. And apparently this boy, a wicked witch, had transformed him into a, into um, some smelly little kid with injuries and he couldn't actually cure the wounds. So he, um, he comes, the little boy comes to the village and he's hungry, right? So he walks around the village looking for food and all the villagers reject him because he stinks and they're all harassing him and carrying on. So he um, finally finds one woman, uh, a grandmother who was a widow, who fed him. After he finished eating, he uh, went out and he encountered a number of children who were playing in the village and he wanted to join, but the children, you know, started teasing him. So this little Baru Clithing kid, the little magician, he gets really angry. And he, um, he rams a stick into the ground. Each villager in turn tried to pull the stick out, and of course they couldn't remove it. And this has um, reflections and themes of um, the Arthurian legend of pulling the sword out of the stone, you know. Anyway, this, uh, this little upstart kid, the stinky kid magician he pulls the stick out of the water and of course the whole village floods except the old lady that took uh, took care of him and fed him so it's kind of like a moral story but what's interesting is the stick uh, in the central aspect of flooding or, or it's like a plug or a, or you know that prevents the world from flooding so that's your central axis more like the nail of java so shortly after the um, appearance of the indonesian crop circles with their allusion to flooding uh, and um, water and an Axis Mundi site, uh, I realised it was talking about the Middle East. Uh, so here we see uh, Mecca uh, with the Kaaba stone. Again, we've got Kaaba, ancient Egyptian word for soul spirit, uh, same as Merkaba, uh, you know, Kabbalah. These are all ancient seed syllables that predate Semitic ling language scripts, but they were just uh, incorporated into. Um, the Hebrew uh, and the Semitic peoples, both of Islam and Jewish. Of further interest, if one wants to go and do the research, is there's meant to be a well underneath, uh, called the Zamzam well, underneath the Kaaba stone, and this, uh, the legend has it that this was uh, a well of immortality, and that they had a stone or a plug, which is meant to be, a, I think there's a meteorite in there, uh, this can all be checked up and validated on uh, on YouTube and other people, other researchers, that this plug is designed to prevent the world from flooding. So there's that flooding theme again, uh, Zam Zam well, uh, underneath the Kaaba stone in Mecca. But this was not the origin of the myth, because this myth goes much, much further back into ancient Egypt, and um, I described this in full in my last video in regards to the flood of Atlantis that was carried over into into the Egyptian rites, and I got this all uh, in during vision during my NDE, so people have to go back to my last video to see the connection of flood rites, or the, or the knowledge of external flood rites and where they actually originated from. Here we have uh, an Orthodox Jewish practitioner with his, uh, what they call a Teflon on his head, which is a black box on his forehead. So we can see the similarities between um, the black box and the relationship to um, the planet Saturn. This was the god of the Jewish people. They used to pray to the god uh, of Saturn, um, which was a planet, and which is connected with time. So this starts to unravel. 
And when we take this um, this L, this god L, uh, into linguistics, we get Angel, uh, Michael, Raphael. Uh, one is elevated on an escalator, escal later. You know, the designator EL is always about Saturn. One is elected. I mean, all of these uh, personifications of Saturn, which have sprinkled down and come through the uh, linguistic chain of our uh, language. So they're, you know, Saturnian rings. I mean, the rings, and when we get married, we put rings on our fingers and we put earrings. So it's all connected. But of more importance uh, is that the Muladra crop circle was uh, implying a connection to the energetic subtle bodies, uh, or, you know, the spinning wheels, the chakra, this is the energy centers of the human consti constitution. But um, what I noticed was the, you had the Islam connection connected to the, uh, the elements or, or the four elements in, uh, in metaphysics, earth, air, fire, water, um, with, with the lake and the flooding. <clears throat> so you had the rising of water or the, uh, connected to emotion or violence. So of course, by showing us the, uh, the Muladra chakra, as you can see here, the next chakra that uh, moving up the chakral chain towards you know from the base up you probably just below the navel is the Swadhisthana chakra and this is the one you can see here now uh, and of course it has a crescent moon as the symbol in it which is kind of interesting because Islam is uh, called the crescent moon you know the crescent of the Middle East a reference to this moon the sickle moon so I've only really really just briefly touch the tree of life and its relationship to Saturn and the cube and we take that back to the crop circles of Winton Wil uh, Wilton Windmill and we see that there is light somehow is affecting our DNA uh, transforming it uh, from um, a time-based three-dimensional being into a multi-dimensional being if we can actually transcend past the Saturnian cube which is the trap of time and this is a very, very difficult ascension. I've personally had a near-death experience um, uh, myself many years ago. So I'm sort of like looking down on this envelope and know that people have to go through a lot of internal work to try and clear a lot of dualistic concepts, which I'm not going to digress into here because it's far too much information. But uh, the diagram I've got here of the chakral inner lights it, what's interesting is the Hebrews have a, a festival called the, um, the Festival of Lights, which is the Chanaka, uh, which sounds very similar to Chakra, so which is an ancient uh, Sanskrit word. So there's a lot of similarities linguistically. Now I'm going to um, just briefly go back to the the timeline of the twelve water-based crop circles here, from one through to twelve, uh, and I just want to remember I. I highlighted Krasnodar Russia in uh, red uh, the date 24th of May which uh, one exactly one year later China has uh, a similar crop circle so we need to follow that thread of that date the 24th of May and link the Chinese uh, flood crop circle to Krasnodar and in case we miss the clue it's exactly one solar year so you've got the Sun involved again which then Krasnodar linked back to Willaston Grange. So there's been a continuous narrative all the way through. Now here you can see uh, a composite and in the lower left is uh, Krasnodar, uh, one of the, which was one of the first ones that came up with this great big flooding um, theme. And of course you can see the yellow line um, where it's pointing towards Krasnodar, Russia on the lower right. And it says May the 24th, 2011. But it's coming from a, an earlier crop circle called Willaston Grange, which appeared on the Severn River uh, next to Oldfield Nuclear Reactor. Um, and this appeared in um, Willaston Grange July 2010. Now hidden within its alignments, which lay hidden dormant for eight months, was the Fukushima disaster because one of the first alignments that came out of it pointed directly to the Fukushima Nuclear Reactor. So, 24 alignments later, which defies mathematical odds. Seriously, I mean, 24 alignments with a continuous narrative. Uh, people need to go back and see that video. Uh, the narrative spans right across around the planet towards um, very powerful elite sites, Bohemian Grove, some powerful Freemason sites in London, the United Grand Lodge. 
uh, shallow earthquakes, strange antennas in Exmouth, Australia, uh, along with, um, you know, information of, I don't know, just symbolic information that was um, in the area of Kabbalah and specialty symbols. And don't forget we have to include the new Iranian crop formation that's just um, come up as the 25th alignment in Wollaston Grange. So I just think uh, the staggering uh, array of alignments just defies logic. So please go back and see the link uh, which finally ends up in Krasnodar which I was linking to flooding, water, uh, the archetype of, um, of water uh, which was connected to emotion and violence due to the collapse in the economic global situation. So now we have this twelfth crop formation, flood crop formation, uh, symbolic of flooding, which has turned up in uh, Z Shandong, Zebo, China. So I predict that China's economy is going to collapse shortly uh, and we're going to get massive uh, global unrest as well, probably in Argentina's economy has gone. I'd say Italy might be a target, showing us all these crop formations in Italy as well. So I'd say the whole lot's going to go like uh, pretty much as fast as how Atlantis went. That's the warning that I'm getting here. So that's all the negative stuff, you know, all the turmoil and unrest. But now we need some positives. So what's the 1111 sun gate? Finally I got a vision um, that took me to Stonehenge. And uh, here we see well, what remains of Stonehenge in the UK. And you can see um, the pillars that are standing on uh, either side of the altar. And if we reconstruct that particular, um, we reconstruct the whole of Stonehenge, we end up with something quite interesting. And here we see an aerial shot uh, with the altar in the center there. Uh, this one here, I quickly grab from the net. You can also see the altar in the middle there. And and arrowed in red, uh, I'm pointing towards the the main um, alignment gate, which would be used to uh, in the ancient days. They used to use this to um, observe the precession of equinox, which was the 26,000 year cycle. Uh, of the sun moving back through the zodiac signs like it would move like uh, one degree every 72 years so they had to measure this so it was um, they were used as sun gates but this is not the you know this one at Stonehenge is relatively young compared to uh, going back further in time uh, and you can see these things all over the planet uh, in modern architecture now these sun gates aren't new uh, because they are all over the world and they've been around for a very very long time um, here you see the Champs-Élysées in Paris uh, and this is all again connected to um, uh, ancient Kabbalah and it, it goes all the way back to Egypt as well so I've got a whole myriad of these things, there's one in Japan there's one in South America so there's one in ancient Egypt so we've got these things all over the world here we see an ancient Sumerian seal and you can see the two figurines with the, what seems to be a flying object on top and this is meant to represent um, the heavenly realms. Another Egyptian version uh, which the four figurines on the outer side are considered uh, the four pillars which would symbolically hold up the heavens. But I'm more interested in the, uh, the central sun gate or the twin pillars which the twin pillars have, you know, they've been here for you know, many, many, many thousands of years and many researchers have seen them. Um, and yes, Freemasonry uses them uh, as much as anybody else because, you know, Freemasonry has a lot of connections to the esoteric. And here we see in Mecca and uh, all around the world have these twin pillars. So here even right down to your humble little church in the middle of a country town. Now in some orthodox religions they have uh, these twin locks of hair which is the same thing uh, which goes back further into ancient Egypt uh, with the Neem's headdress. So we've got these twin pillars and in some cases they have three pillars which is all connected to Kabbalah. Uh, 
but these twin pillars um, were passed from Egypt to the Hebrew peoples in the form of the Kabbalah as well. And I said, I don't think, uh, I definitely know that Kabbalah is not a Hebrew system. But it is a, it is a pre-Egyptian system. And here you've got the twin pillars of Boaz and Yakin, which are, they're meant to be, you know, pillars that hold up the world and support the world and keep balance. And the pillars of severity and the pillars of mildness uh, you can see here uh, with the overlaid tree of life. The central pillar is the path we're meant to take. It's it's the path of love uh, and you try to remain away from those two extremes. But of course the oldest um, sun gate um, and I'm not promoting pyramidology by any means it's just that the origin of humanity started in the in the these areas and the enigma of the pyramids has kept us um, you know, mystified for millennia. So here I've got the uh, the main pyramid, and during my NDE, which I've spoken quite uh, extensively on, uh, there was only one pyramid standing in ancient Egypt, uh, approximately about seventy thousand years ago. Uh, it was constructed, and um, it used to flood annually with the Nile, and of course it would create um, imagery, sacred geometry, in the imagery. Uh, reflecting the heavens and the earth and of course I've highlighted the doorway which again is the uh, original sun gate um, which was used by higher initiates so they would um, enter in through this sun gate which uh, is the shape of an 11 but the origin of these two pillars goes back further um, back to the god Amun uh, in the headdress of Amun you can see here, but also uh, they were considered pillars of light or feathers. Feathers were considered light. Uh, and so this was all connected to um, origins of the bird people or the bird-headed gods back in Egypt. And these twin pillars or twin feathers were considered um, were, were spiritual laws, you know, to adhere to, like the ten spiritual laws, like the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. So they were, it was all connected to kingship and royalty. And if these laws weren't adhered to, then there would be there would be times of extreme imbalance. And if all of our three-dimensional material plane is governed by the higher fourth, fifth, and so on dimensions, which eventually they um, come from the source of the light, which I've shown the effects of the solar. Uh, winds on our consciousness and the breakup of our DNA and how it, how, um, it breaks up and reformats that we are actually deeply constructed on a, on a much deeper level of, of, um, of light I mean when we analyze matter there's no such thing as matter because it's all energy and anything uh, energy can only transmute into different forms so so if we peer back into the distant past the way distant past we see these whole civilizations have collapsed due to a possible disconnection from higher dimensions or an absolute source and this is pretty much the crux of um, the whole of our history and people have wondered what's happened well uh, I got this during my NDE that there was a, a disconnection from the from the absolute source from a very high level uh, within our social structures. So this gets us uh, further to uh, an event that's coming up in the form of um, the 11-11 event which is um, another vibration or another, another period of light coming which is a higher vibration and allows everyone to actually attain. Now not everyone can go through extreme rebirth rites uh, and have near-death experiences. So a couple of thousand years ago the Creator sent a few beings that represented what humanity could possibly evolve to uh, Buddha, Jesus, you know, people like this, enlightened beings and these enlightened beings uh, represented love which was uh, the personification of Venus uh, and this crop circle here at Roundway Hill had the pentagonal makeup of, um, of Venus in the pentagram shape uh, what was surprising is when I um, I got a, again another vision doing this crop circle that there was what I call a, a perturbative gateway, in other words a vibrating pentagonal gateway. The outer 
red and white intersecting larger pentagrams form a dodecahedron and the inner uh, green and red uh, pentagrams are the they were very close to each other not opposite so I quickly found out that they were showing us a perturbative gateway which we can see moving in this next section and you can see that um, you know the original crop circle had uh, slightly off cambered little dots then I realized what had happened is there was actually two pentagrams using those ten dots the green and red dots so I lined them up and there was um, a perturbative gateway or a, what a, a vibrating pentagram which um, the connection of the pentagram is the Venusian, uh, the eight-year Venusian cycle through the heavens, which I'm going to show you here now. There was a further clue to this roundway hill with the three death burrows at the base, which was connected to another crop circle you can see on the lower right there, all to do with the um, the, uh, the chakras again, and they've come up again, you know, starting at the base chakra, which we've, I've just covered. Another clue to this uh, 1111 gateway is the five large circles um, coupled with the Greek stylized uh, edging. You can see the spiral squared edging, which is classical Greek. So it may have been alluding to the Olympics in 2012. So it was pointing towards you know around our time now that there's some sort of a, a gateway this Venusian gateway now we get to um, the final crux of this 1111 and now the first 11 um, I, I've equated to the Sun gate which were pillars of concrete but they were originally transposed from the laws which come from the light now th this constant reference that I'm making to light is not about at the light of the Sun or light of Venus it's about the inner light of our mind when we make deeper realizations or spiritual realizations if we adhere to the central tenets and the central covenantal laws that are sent to us from the, from um, the Creator now a lot of people break those laws that's their choice but if we remain on those laws then we actually start to receive higher information now of course everybody knows the classic story of the uh, of the baptism you know John the Baptist baptizing Christians before Christ arrives uh, and there's a lot of um, um, anticipation for a second coming of a messianic coming so you know this is getting into some areas of the, the origin of baptism if one baptizes oneself in in a, a being of love then of course as the spirit hits the world and lifts this vibration through these very complex um, unfoldments that I'm showing here then of course people are going to be okay if they're doing the right thing it's only people who are doing the wrong thing who will fall into a dualized schism of chaos and that's what this gateway is all about now of course earlier I mentioned you know the higher baptismal rites in connection with Egypt and uh, this is what the, the thread of this whole video is about is about um, you know baptism rites via inner flooding of our consciousness but as I said uh, you know not everyone can have an NDE and I've already mentioned this not everyone you know but everyone can uh, actually accept love uh, as their central tenant now there's many scriptural references to uh, talking about dying in Christ or you know this is a very Christian theological um, core here that I'm talking about uh, but they talk of a second death and uh, this second death is uh, with fire you know or the spirit of fire uh, to be thrown into the fires of hell so what we've got now is a, a baptism by fire which is also showing us all of these flooding themes so the whole world is being baptized in this second death and this is like you know this has to be this way I mean covenants get planted into our consciousness 2000 years ago but then they need to be stress tested and the only way they can be stress tested is from the origin of where the covenant came from now for the second 11 Venus has just had a transit um, June the 5th in Australia now apparently um, you know these transits come approximately 130 years apart 
Uh, the last one was 129 and a half years ago, 1874 and 1882. Now the Venus transits usually come in pairs, you know, a few years apart. So of course when you have two of them, this pairing effect, and this time we had one in uh, June the 8th, 2004, and of course June the 5th, 6th, 2012. Now if we place an image of what the transit looks like, crossing the Sun, uh, if you get the two transits, um, they would look like this. So one can see that this rare event as, uh, you know, can be seen as an 11 of uh, Venus, uh, Venus's pathway crossing across the Sun. But further, and I'll use the Tiahuanaco uh, Sun Gate uh, as an example because it was the best image that I had, but, you know, it's the twin pillars, 11, uh, with the gateway of the Venusian gateway which was shown in Roundway Hill Crop Circle which was it, was it was warning us of. So we've just passed through this gate which is pretty exciting. And as I said, and as I said earlier, uh, gateways don't go one way. I mean, and you've got to understand a little bit about astrology here. You know, most people have astrological signs when predominant aspects of their personality come through um, our planets in our solar system. Um, this uh, also indicates, uh, and I got this part in part of my vision as well, is that the souls that are entering the planet now are going to have such powerful gifts, you know, which of love and also um, connected with the Sun and Venus. So this is a really important gateway that, that floods in both ways. This is the messianic return. These amazing souls will be pouring through. They're immense souls. They're coming from the Godhead. So, you know, we, we should expect to see some pretty profound changes hit the planet. And as this higher energy hits uh, into our lower vibrations, well, they're going to start breaking up. This is what's causing all this chaos happening here, you know, um, around the world. We see violence and this negativity happening. This is this flux of this new energy hitting the planet. So there's a lot of complex dynamics going on. But look, thanks for watching, and uh, I'm going to finish it up here for now and uh, stay posted and we'll see what comes up.